if it turns out saturated fat is bad the way that it's been claimed for decades, these diets kind of start falling apart. His cherry picking showed that the countries that ate more saturated fat had more heart disease, but there was all these huge holes in that theory, right? With the places where they ate tons of saturated fat and had no heart disease, it was like very low. And uh, of course he just left those out. They looked at their actual level of heart disease and these people were in the top 0.01% of risk factor. They had the highest LDL like in the world, yet they had better than average in these scores, right? So it was like this huge thing. They're like, whoa, these people are healthier than even people with low cholesterol. Oh, this is the best diet for longevity and quality of life because this is how we've always eaten. And I'm like, that makes sense to me. One of the pushbacks I saw because people are essentially just lying about their age. You know, there's no there's no real record of their age. So sometimes they're doing it to get money from the government or whatever it may be. Isn't that a possible hole? We know the modern diet and lifestyle is not ideal for humans, right? It's just everyone agrees on this. Vegans agree on it, right? There's pollutants in the air. There's the bad water. Like everything is lower quality. People still live to 120. Right? We have people, we know people can live to 120. No one studies this because it goes against the entire paradigm. Anyone who used natural diet, lifestyle, herbs, whatever, were quacks. And it was an actual PR campaign. And what PR is, is propaganda, actually. Michael Rose, like I said, 40 something years, PhD, studying this stuff. He thinks that we lived much longer. He says we could have lived to 160. Brian Sanders is the mastermind behind the soon to be released documentary, Food Lies, which is set to blow the lid off of all the lies that we have been fed about modern food. Lies that are making us sicker and weaker by the day. He's the voice behind the Peak Human podcast, a juggernaut in the nutrition space that consistently ranks in the global top five. But Brian isn't just talk. You can find him coaching folks up at Evolve Healthcare and pushing this mission forward at Sapien, the health education company that he co-founded. This episode is packed with information to make yourself as healthy, strong, and educated about nutrition and an optimal lifestyle as possible. Today we are covering what is an ancestral diet? Why are diets so culty and how do you stop yourself from falling into that trap? Where the paranoia about saturated fat actually came from and who orchestrated that lie? The truth about blue zones, longevity, and lifespan. Why modern food is even worse than we believe and who is writing these dietary guidelines? Here's the reality that we're up against, everyone. We have access to more food than we ever have, yet our health and wellness gets worse with every generation. Today, we're gonna learn how to change that. So with all that out of the way, guys, my name's Andrew with Holistic Motion. Let's get into it. So you you talk a lot about ancestral diets. How would you personally define ancestral dieting? Uh, well, we had a great guest, Dr. Michael Rose. He's an epic aging researcher. He was at UC Davis for like 50 years or something. And he just said the simplest line in the film, all organisms do best on the diet they evolved on. This is just it. It's like a tiger eats what a tiger eats. You know, koala eats what a koala eats. This is just what it is. And so with humans, it's very diverse, though. It's very varied because we're highly adaptable. We can live all over the world. So there is no one exact ancestral diet, but it's a dietary spectrum or a framework that to me is is very solid that this is what humans will thrive on. It is really interesting following that that kind of thought pattern too because it's you know like you said this animal eats this this animal eats that but then the little bit of diversity in people's diets it's like if you look at different bears for example like a panda isn't going to eat the exact same diet as like a polar bear but they still eat more or less the same you know so it's humans have this kind of framework that they fall into, but there's still that individual variance in there. We're um, the most adaptable though. Yeah, we are the most varied. And that's part of why we're the species that lives in the most terrains and environments and out of anywhere, right? We can live anywhere. We live in the Arctic. We can live near the ocean. We, yeah, we can do anything. Yeah, it's it's like remarkable how adaptable we actually are. And I, I don't know, I think it's really cool because a lot of people are trying to find like this this one diet and it's, I feel like it just kind of shows there. there's not a single way to do it. There's just kind of a framework that everybody's going to fall into until you start to find out those little individual tweaks that that you're going to need. So like I've been following uh, what I would say is an ancestral diet based on how you define it. And probably more recently kind of leaning toward like a carnivore diet. 
Um, it's not something I wanted to do. It's just I had like undiagnosed colitis and it went untreated for like 20 years. And then, you know, I'm kind of at a point where it's just like, oh, this works perfectly to make sure that I don't have tons of gut issues and stuff like that. But um, I, I try to pressure test all these different things as much as I can because it feels like diets are sort of becoming the new dogma or religion for people. Why do, why do you think that is? Mm. Yeah, well, what you eat is a it's a kind of an intimate thing. It happens every day. It happens with your family. It's something that you love. It's some food people hate foods. And it's it's one of the most human things ever, right? For all of history, what's been most consistent with our lives? It's just what are we going to eat? What are we going to eat, right? So, I don't yeah, it's just central to being human. Yeah, definitely. It's uh, there there's something about it where I it's almost like I've been I've kind of been feeling like for a lot of people, it's kind of some level of like death denial, if if that makes sense. Like uh, a lot of people are like arguing and nitpicking over these very micro changes that only really seem to like fractionally improve people's longevity or their quality of life. So uh, to kind of go back toward ancestral dieting and like what the what the right things are to do, what would you say are like a few of the constants that that you personally have noticed with yourself and with your clients? Yeah, it, I mean, that's what I set out to do six years ago, full time. I've been at this 10 years. It's what do all good diets have in common and what do all good diets leave out? And that that was just like my ultimate goal. I was an engineer, right? So I'm not in, coming from the doctor or nutrition space, which I think helped me, right? Because I wasn't bought into right. their paradigms and their dogma. And so I could just say, okay, well, let's just look at this like a, engineering problem right what what is it and that's what i've done and I, yeah i used to be in some more dietary camps back six years ago when i first started because especially what works for you first then you just think this is the way and that's why people go down the vegan route they're like oh well i tried it worked and this is it that's the only way so i was stuck into that too with yeah the more like meat-based low carb type of thing and then i realized okay you don't have to do that or there's there's different ways to do it. So yeah, I, I kept zooming out and we had to actually remake my entire Food Lies series. We started from scratch. We threw away all the old interviews and the old script, rewrote it, turned into a six-part series. Now it's way better because we're not trapped in the one way of doing things. And part of that was figuring out what do all good diets have in common? What do all good diets leave out? And Dr. Weston Price actually was a good person that to, to know and to study that figured this out kind of 100 years ago. And what he found, and what I found is, is really consistent, is that all the good diets, and what is the ancestral diet? I don't even like the term. It's a little loaded because people are like, oh, are you some paleo bro? Or like, oh, are you going to go live in a cave now? You know, there's all <laughs> these things like that. It's like, no, no, this is just what humans are meant to eat and what all good diets have in common and what Weston Price found. He went around the world 100 <laughs> years ago and studied all these cultures that weren't contacted by uh, mainstream commerce yet. So they weren't getting the sugar, flour, and oil that would, would be shipped in and then ruin people's diet. Basically, I jumped ahead to the conclusion of like, what did all good diets leave out? And it was these industrially processed ingredients that as soon as they came in, they ruined people's health. And he saw this in real time 100 years ago when there were still some populations left that didn't have all these foods of commerce in their diet yet. And basically all processed foods are made up of some combination of sugar, flour, and oil. And so you study these people uh, all around the world, it's completely separate, right? They, they had no contact with each other and they were just on their own kind of doing their traditional diet. And they were eating whole foods and they were eating as much animal foods as they could get. As, mu as, as many animal foods as their environment provided, that's how much they would eat. And they would fill in the rest with other whole foods from the earth, right? And whether it be sweet potatoes and Okinawa, not that, well, Weston Price didn't go there, but that's a blue zone thing. Yeah. If anyone wants to jump ahead. Oh, to, dude, we're going down the blue zone uh, the whole for yeah, sure. Yeah. So a uh, little preview there. Yeah, okay. These people were stuck in Okinawa after World War II. They only had sweet potatoes and they had fish and some vegetables. Great, perfectly good diet. You know, you're getting your, your fish, your seafood. They got what they could. They had some pork running around. They had some vegetables and they had some sweet potatoes. Great. There's nothing wrong with that diet. It's, it's based on whole foods and it doesn't have any of the sugar flour and seed oil mixed in and you're great. So he he saw this 100 years ago though. That, that's 
the most interesting part is before it crept into every corner of the globe. I even went to Africa three years ago to film for Food Lies. And even out in the middle of nowhere in Tanzania, they still had sacks of flour. And then they'd have like Gatorade bottles filled with cooking oil. Wow. It was crazy. Yeah, there's these little villages and they have these like, they'll, they'll get, they call it cooking oil, right? It's just this like terrible corn oil or something. And in a, seriously, and then like an old Gatorade bottle that they found. And then they're oh. cooking with it. And it, it's just a nightmare. So uh, the people who avoided these foods and just included some version of whole foods based on animal foods, that's that's the whole framework, right? That's what it is. And it yeah, it's consistent around the globe for all of history that kept people healthy. Right. So you mentioned Weston A. Price. I mean, that's something that's come up with you, with um, Dr. Kate Shanahan. When I had her on, um, Paul Check, I've talked about him a handful of times. It's like pretty consistently he gets referenced. And for for anybody who <clears throat> for anybody who hasn't read anything by him, uh, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration is probably the book to start at as as far as that topic goes. It is incredible. Um, but he was kind of the he was the counter to Ansel Keys. Correct. Well, not like exactly. Keys released his Ansel stuff, Keys. and then, or am I am I misremembering the order? No, no, it's a little later. John Yudkin was a counter to Ansel Keys. So Weston Price did this in the 1930s. Ansel Keys, that whole started in the 1950s, and there was the President Eisenhower had a heart attack, and there was this this big idea of like what's causing these new problems, heart disease, and well, really Crisco and uh, all the the fake butters and you know margarines came in and smoking. Well, you know, right. that was big, but they decided <laughs> to blame it on saturated fat, the thing that we've eaten for all of history. So that was more in the 1950s and went into the 60s, was a bit of the Ansel Keys versus John Yudkin thing. And Ansel Keys did the seven country study and the six country study. And it, he basically just had these correlations that showed that, you know, his, his cherry picking showed that the countries that ate more saturated fat had more heart disease, but there was all these huge holes in that theory, right? With the places where they ate tons of saturated fat and had no heart disease, it was like very low. And uh, of course he just left those out. And then John Yudkin was the kind of counterpart to that argument, which was, he said, he was a little bit on the Weston Price bandwagon. So maybe that's what you you got mixed up a little bit is yeah, he said, yeah. he's like, hey, everywhere that they, they get the sugar flour oil, they get unhealthy very quickly and get the diseases of civilization. So yes, he kind of echoed Weston Price's work. Right. So you, you've you've spoken a bit about uh, blue zones and um, pushback on them. Also, uh, for for those who don't know, can you briefly explain what they are and and more so why it is that they've been coming under such significant scrutiny lately? Yeah, I don't know how long ago it was. Dan Butner wrote a book called The Blue Zones. Maybe it was like twenty years ago or more. He, so he's just a vegetarian guy that had this idea that it's healthy to be vegetarian, which a lot of people had, especially in the 70s, you know, 60s, 70s, kind of this hippie movement. Like, it's this whole thing. I think it's really this long agenda against yeah. red meat that we can talk about in more detail. But, you know, Dan Buechner was part of that. And this is what he believed. So he went around the world and saw what he wanted to see. And so he went to seven places that had very long life ex expectancy, uh, a lot of people over 100, you know, a lot of centenarians, and basically just cherry picked and s said that they were eating plant based when they when they didn't. But they also had a, many other healthy lifestyle factors, which was actually way more important. And they were eating whole foods. So basically, he went to me, I took away is okay, so he went around the world found people with amazing healthy lifestyles, great sense of community sense of purpose, you know, eating whole foods, exercising, walking everywhere. And they lived a long time. Absolutely, I agree with that. But then he tried to make him seem plant-based. But someone like my friend, Mary Ruddick, uh, who goes around the world debunking them, going to these same blue zones and showing what they actually eat. And it's always animal-based, actually. If you look at by calories and what they're using animal fat, right? They're in Icaria. She spent a long time in Icaria. And these people are eating goat and lamb nose to tail they're eating the organs they're eating all the fat you know they're, they're not using any of the the seed oils 
there. Uh, I went to actually uh, in Costa Rica, Nicoya Peninsula is one of the blue zones. I went with her and we went to a, a little um, family and they were eating traditionally and they had cows and they were getting milk and they made cheese from it and they had fresh raw milk. They had chickens and they had pigs running around and they would butcher a pig each month and they would have a bucket of fat and they would only cook with this lard and they were just eating cheese and meat and chicken and eggs and all this stuff. And yeah, then they would have to supplement their diet with some like bread. I, they, you know, they, they'd make bread and they would had some like cheaper things because they didn't have much money, but it was basically animal based. So uh, the blue zones also got popular more recently because it was on Netflix and they made a <laughs> documentary about it. Right. And the, the documentary obviously gave a, a little, a little bit of pushback on certain areas and stuff. But uh, like when I very first learned about ancestral dieting, you know, it was probably for the same reason everybody gets into virtually any diet is it kind of becomes, well, maybe this is the, the solution, you know? Um, but the way that it was explained to me is like, oh, this is the best diet for longevity and quality of life because this is how we've always eaten. And I'm like, that makes sense to me. Um, but a lot of people will then, uh, you know, as a way to like validate it, they'll point to different kinds of tribes and be like, look at how long their lives are, look at their lack of disease. One of the pushbacks I saw on blue zones is, uh, because people are essentially just lying about their age. You know, there's no, there's no real record of their age. So sometimes they're doing it to get money from the government or whatever it may be. Um, isn't that a possible hole in like a lot of these, I guess some of the tribal evidence is these people will be like, oh, they live this long, but they don't necessarily have a record of those kinds of things. Does that make sense? That's a good question. Yeah, and actually, so for the Blue Zone part, Nina Teicholz, who wrote the great book, Big Fat Surprise, started uh, looking into this stuff. So if you want to read more about that, yeah, they're in the Blue Zones, a lot of fake records. But with uh, the tribes, they they do have ways of, of t asking them like how long they live and by getting like world events, this is what I've heard is, and if, and they can check it, like, were you around for this? And if they, oh yeah, there was this that happened. Or even if there was like a flood in like 1930, then they could say, yeah, there was this that happened. So there, there are ways to check, but uh, it, it is a decent point, but really you should listen to Dr. Michael Rose speak on this. Cause he actually thinks it's the opposite that these people lived way longer than us. He thinks oh. that, in the past, and this makes sense to me, we know even in the modern, okay, we know the modern diet and lifestyle is not ideal for humans, right? It's just everyone agrees on this. Vegans agree on it, right? There's pollutants in the air. There's the bad water. Like everything is lower quality and all that. People still live to 120, right? We have people, we know people can live to 120. So we know that the human body can live to 120. So Michael Rose, like I said, 40 something years, PhD studying this stuff and he's he thinks that we lived much longer he says we could have lived to 160 that back in the day if you have if you have all of the diet and environment that your genes expect and that we would have lived much longer and that the problem is we don't have good ways of dating the the remains we have so few remains and we, we don't even know how, to, you can't date them. Like what we do to date them is look at wear and tear on bones or teeth. And then we compare that to modern day. So they say, oh, this, this person must've died at 40 because these, they have the bones of a 40 year old or the teeth of a 40 year old in our modern environment. This is a huge topic. Oh, right. This whoa. is crazy. Yeah. And then that we're like, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. They're like, wait, wait, no, no. I've seen these hundred, like they could be 70 and look like they're 40 or have the bones of a 40 because they're eating naturally and they're eating naturally living. And you just kind of blew my mind a little oh, bit. I that's know. It's, it's crazy. When I first heard about this, I'm like, that's how they do it. Holy crap. Yeah. Cause it's like, if, if people are, you know, aging at, at slower rates and stuff like that, it's not necessarily going to show up on their, on their body the way that it would on us. Um, and I suppose carbon dating doesn't necessarily work in that short of a, uh, it's that's short can't. of a time frame. Yeah. Well, think about it. Like, like, how would you do it? Like, it, it, it's just, we only know how humans age by how we age in a modern right. world. Yeah, we only have us as a reference. Man, that is freaking wild. I had never considered that. Yeah. Um, 
geez, man. So uh, one of the one of the things again to just kind of poke on ancestral dieting uh, a little bit more. There's a lot of people out there that will say ancestral dieting really isn't ancestral dieting at all, and obviously it's an imperfect name for it, but it's probably the closest that we've got. But because of how much like genetic engineering and selective breeding uh, has gone into the the food that we now consume, it's like our food has like little to nothing in common with the foods that we ate even just like a couple hundred years ago. What would what would you say about that? That's a fair point as well. But all the, the usually these people are the people pushing modern diets or eat everything or everything in moderation. <laughs> I'm like, okay, yeah. the foods you're pushing are even worse. They're way yeah. worse. So yes, I did admit this is not that era where we had the cleanest game meat that you know was just eating its natural diet and all the fruit was like this small, tiny, you know, less sugar, like not covered in glyphosate. So yeah. it's completely different, but the, the best we can do is get as close to naturals as possible. So yeah, these people aren't going to convince me that, okay, you're right. Now I'm just going to eat pop tarts or, you know, I'm going <laughs> to eat like fake meat or yeah, I'm going to eat like a, a soy uh, burger or something. Like yeah. That. Yeah. Soy black bean burger. Yeah. It's like, well, yeah, but so I, I mean, I do take that into consideration. Like I'm not going to eat sugary fruit all day. I mean, yes, our ancestors ate fruit, but I'm not going to eat pineapple and mango and these giant like GMO versions of, you know, strawberries that just came into existence. So, or yeah, so I take it into consideration. Yeah. It's like, or I, I get regenerative meat. I try to get the best meat possible and I get, and I'll eat an apple, but I'm going to just eat one apple. I'm not going to, you know, go crazy. Right. On the, um, I, I think that's what a lot of people, you know, like I said, a lot of people are looking at diets as like a version of death denial and um, I, I feel like that kind of bleeds into looking for the perfect diet where it's people will go, okay, ancestral dieting, but our food wasn't really like that. So this isn't really ancestral dieting. So I'm just not going to eat this way. And it's like, okay, it's not 100% ancestral dieting, but it's like, in some way, this is like harm reduction for yourself. So it's like, if, if it's 95% better, you're not going to do it because of that 5%, you know, it's almost like people are kind of looking for a loophole as like a way to not do it because it's not exactly this way but with like all that engineering and selective breeding obviously foods become more palatable foods become more calorically dense what do you think some of the implications of that have been well yeah that's just look at everyone in society it's depending on the studies 88 to 93 percent are metabolically unhealthy and that's exactly it it's yeah just becoming more energy dense i'm into the nutrient to energy ratio after studying all this stuff for so long that's what I think it all kind of comes down to is like, and, and our foods in the past had a higher nutrient to energy ratio. And, and I'll explain a little bit. Energy is, is fat or carbs to me, right? And then nutrients are protein, vitamins, minerals, all the essential stuff. So for all of history, we could go out into nature and we'd eat foods around us and we'd, we'd be always trying to optimize animal foods, which would be the more of the protein and nutrients. And then getting the, you know, more of the energy from either the fat or the carbs from the fruit and berries and honey, whatever we could get. And it, it all worked out, right? The, the ratio is correct. This is what the human body expects. This is what we got. Now, most people are getting too little nutrients and way too much energy. And this is just a factor of, of the food choices that we now have, right? So all of these processed foods are just in this imbalance. They're in, not in a natural ratio. And so basically, you're mathematically screwed. This is actually a concept uh, that Lane Norton really liked. Uh, we were talking about him before the show. Right. He's a little bit in a different camp than than me. And we, we had some good podcasts that we got along well. And now he's in the Food Lies series. And he was actually spitting out these concepts uh, when in the interview so that will show up in the film because I was kind of like, hey, this is how I think about it. And he was agreeing with it, that it's it's actually you don't want these calorie dense things and why that is is because well it's the opposite of nutrient dense basically right mm -hmm. you don't want excess energy right to me uh, you, we want energy to get through the day right we need fats and carbs to fuel our bodies but we don't want more than enough right so it's this balance and the foods are out of balance like even like the the fruit like you were saying it's, it's all different it's engineered and it they've been grown so the problem is now everyone's getting too much energy, right? If you keep pumping the apple to be bigger and bigger 
And even with the animals, if you put a pig in a feedlot and you're giving them soybean oil and a bunch of corn and wheat, and they're just getting super fat, they're getting more energy dense or more calorically dense and less nutrient dense, right? And that is a problem. So it's like, now you're, I say mathematically screwed because when you, you eat all organisms, all animals eat to get nutrients. It's called, it's really the protein leverage hypothesis. And I'm going to interview mm. these scientists, Robin Heiner and Simpson, that figured this out, you know, decades ago and have been studying it, that any animal eats to get a certain amount of protein specific. They were just looking at protein, which is a good proxy for nutrients because it is a big nutrient that we need. Yeah. And they would eat and they gave, say, these mice, the, the, the feed that has the right amount of protein that they would need in their mice diet. And they did fine. And then they took another group of mice and they gave them... Uh, a feed that had less protein and so therefore more energy more c calories empty well new energy calories of fats right, and, carbs. Right. and they ate more of the food to get the same amount of protein and they did the math and they're like okay they, they needed x amount of protein they got it but they had to eat more food to get there right the simplest concept that people don't understand is like the second group with a diluted food with the more energy dense food, the more calorically dense food, less nutrients, less protein, they had to eat more of the food to get the same amount of nutrients. This is exactly what's going on in the entire world is all of the food is more energy dense and less protein and nutrients. So you have to eat more of it to be full. Right. And there's, uh, you know, there's, there's a little bit of stuff out there too, to validate that as far as like cravings go cravings being kind of a, a vehicle to make you eat more to get your your nutrient needs and stuff but it's yeah like, like you said you know if all you're getting is calories that are relatively nutrient void you're going to eat more and eat more and eat more because your body looks at food and goes nutrients vitamins minerals all these different things but if it's not getting it it's going to be like okay well I, I just need to eat more then but obviously that doesn't necessarily pan out with present day um, foods this is the, the best concept in the world, and I wish people cared about it or knew about it. And yeah, there's an author, Mark Shasker, that wrote a couple books that are really great. One called Dorito Effect, which really went into this, and one called The End of Craving. And he just said craving, yes. So and he talks about this exact concept. And part of the problem with, say, the Dorito as an example is it has the fake flavoring that makes your body think it's getting nutrients this is an interesting point right so it's exactly. like exactly yes that's why msg is bad i mean msg probably is is bad and gives people headaches and there's probably you know as a chemical it's probably not great but it's also bad because it's tricking you into thinking that you're getting protein when you're not and that's what's bad so it's like you can eat a bag of doritos pringles the whole thing once you pop you can't stop you can eat the whole thing because <laughs> your body is like oh it tastes savory right? It, it has all the fake flavors. It's got the MSG, all this different stuff, but I'm not getting any protein. I'm not getting any nutrients and you keep going. Right. Yeah. God, it's always kind of funny how it's, uh, it's almost like they almost hide it in plain sight with little slogans like that too, where it's like, it's like, Hey, we mm -hmm. know how much we've engineered this. But we know this is not a one and done. Like it's, it's wild. Um, one of the, one of the other things that a lot of people will talk about with, and this is like, probably the last few years, I feel like I've really started seeing this a lot more is that with ancestral dieting, and I'm one of these people as much as a lot of my friends will give me shit about it. Um, I don't wear sunscreen. And I don't really get sunburns for whatever reason. I'd be curious if you had anything to say about the seed oils, saturated fat, sunscreen, sunburns kind of continuum between mm -hmm. those those topics. Yeah, I think there's definitely something to it for sure. Uh me and my director editor who's making food lives with me have the same thing he's in hawaii and he's just like well i don't have to use sunscreen anymore and i heard actually rob wolf talking about this exactly. probably six five six years ago and he yeah and he's and then it, it made sense to me and i think he explained that that it, it's basically just like inflammation in the, the skin so like if you're eating all these seed oils it's like the the membrane right they make up the cell membrane and if there's a constant constantly inflamed, then it'll be easier to get burned. And if they're correctly, you know, not inflamed, then right. you can withstand the sun like we always have. Yeah, because that's, that's like one of those things that I just, I don't necessarily understand how people kind of explain that away where they'll be like, oh, it's, um, you know, we like we've existed for, you know, millions of years, and we weren't getting 
you know, sunburns all the time, uh, assumptively, um, and, you know, dying of sun related issues. So it's like, how did we manage this unless this just to some degree wasn't nearly as prevalent as as it is now. But saturated fat seems to kind of be one of those linchpins in like ancestral dieting, keto, carnivore, and, um, you know, a couple other diets, they, they all kind of rely on saturated fat not being the issue that it's reported to be. But like, if it turns out saturated fat is bad the way that it's been claimed for decades, these diets kind of start falling apart in in some but not all regards, right? So did, did you by chance see that recent Mendelian randomization about saturated fat? No. Very, very short version. Basically, there's, because um, you know, a, a, for for people listening, Mendelian randomization, they're basically uh, isolating certain genetic disorders so that they can see how they'll affect um, people over a, a long term. It more or less makes like a lifetime human randomized control trial. It's a little more complicated than that, but that that's the gist. Um, and more or less, they they had this group where they just had uh, higher LDL cholesterol levels, and what it showed was that the the group in this randomization that had naturally elevated levels of LDL they ended up having an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. And obviously it's had a lot of people in this camp trying to square that circle of saturated fat not being an independent risk factor. Um, but I guess what's what's been your take on that topic? Um, again, yeah. I, I understand you haven't seen it, but just more or less given that it's showing kind of a linear effect of like increased risk for CVD related to LDL intake. Or yeah. LDL levels, excuse me. Oh yeah, no, this is endlessly fascinating to me and i i'm happy to be wrong about this but i I don't think we are because it just doesn't make sense evolutionarily right but so to me the highest level way to think about this is the entire population is sick they've done that study and like i said 88 to 93 percent of the population is not metabolically unhealthy so in these people who are not unhealthy there's very, very, very few people who are eating a clean diet. I, I'm guessing that you eat a pretty clean diet, right? You're not. Oh, yeah. 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 If I couldn't kill it or grow it like 200 years ago, I don't eat it. Exactly. And I mean, I hang out with some people in Austin that do the same. They're like, we don't go out to eat. You know, people think we're weird. Like, I just cook all my meals at home. You know, we're very into this. But other than that, there are not a lot of people doing this. Like, I think it's less than 1% of the US is doing like my version of clean or your version of clean, which right. is, I mean, okay, I, one, I was traveling and I, you know, I ate something that wasn't correct once a month. Okay. But no one else is doing this. So I think if you are in this normal population, you probably have visceral fat, you probably have elevated trigs, triglycerides, you know, you probably have all these other health problems of elevated glucose. And yes, if you're eating more if you have a higher LDL, it's probably is a bad thing. But there's this certain group of people that are actually, I'm guessing you heard of the lean mass hyper responders. These Maybe. Are, the, are these people that have the, um, oh God, what is it called? Like they have that genetic disorder where they just keep building muscle to like an insane degree? Are they, is that what oh, you're talking no, about? No, no. no uh, Dave Feldman has done this study. He's, he teamed up with this great researcher. And it's people who are in shape they're lean. They, you know, it's not like they're all bodybuilders or anything, but they're, you know, they just carry muscle mass and have low, very low body fat and are super healthy. And they have all these great markers of health, but they have high LDL. And this hmm. is a very small group of people. And they've studied them. And it's been a whole year. And it's just amazing results because they looked at the coronary artery uh, calcium scores. They did CAC, they did all the, the CIMT, I forget which one or both they did to like check their actual measures of heart disease, right? Because mm -hmm. LDL is a proxy, which I think is yeah. actually a bad proxy, but they looked at their actual level of heart disease. And these people were in the top 0.01% of risk factors. They had the highest LDL like in the world or in the US, mm -hmm. yet they had better than average than the, the normal person in these scores, right? So it was like this huge thing. They're like, whoa, these people are healthier than even people with low cholesterol. right? So they're just finally studying this. No one studies this because it goes against the entire paradigm and it goes against the entire statin industry. And yeah, it, so basically to reiterate this whole point I'm making is most of the population is sick. Most of the population, if they have high LDL, it probably is a bad thing. 
But for certain people like me, I, I, say there's a hundred health markers, okay? And in the past six years, nine years really that I've been on this journey, 99 of these health markers got better. Right? I can show you my labs, my triglycerides are very low, my HDL is high, my visceral fat is zero, my you know blood glucose is very good. Like all these things, right? I, I lost like 25 pounds of fat, like I, I'm fit, all these things, 99 things got better. LDL went up. Right. So, so which is, which is it? Is it that I'm, I'm going to die? And for some reason, <laughs> everything got better, but somehow the LDL is going to kill me or is our view of LDL wrong? Or right? is it just this entire cumulative thing where it's like, okay, like you said, 99 things got better. One got bad quote, according to, you know, these, these certain metrics, but yeah. This is what I'm saying. But it, so it's not a clear cut answer too, because if you just say the general population and if you have high LDL, that's what you're saying basically through this study that I should look up. Yes. Lane, sure. Lane was actually how I found out about that one too. It's it's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. No, I should talk about it with him and I look at it for sure because I'm sure, yes, in the normal population, if you have more, okay, it's, it's kind of like if you're, you, you're already eating a bad diet. For most, I say 99% of people are eating a bad diet. And if you're adding more saturated fat to that bad diet, then it probably is worse. Yes. And your LDL probably will go up and it's probably going to be more CVD. And that's what it said. But I'm mm -hmm. saying separately, there's a small group of people that it, it's it's not the case and therefore it's the not opposite. saturated fat. Yeah. Right. Yeah. See, it's this kind of stuff just like wigs me out so much because there's there's always a counter study. You know, there's there's always something to push back at another. And then it's like, you just have to keep digging deeper and deeper and deeper and like really find where, you know, where, where like bedrock is, so to speak of like the truth of all these different dietary things. And, oh my God, man, it's, it's, it's like absolutely no mystery why the average person is so confused about diet because there's always a study to say something else. But, um, I, I, I see you've spoken with Dr. Paul Saladino and, um, Dr. Sean Baker, a lot of people refer to both of them as like alarmists because how they talk about um, like fruit and veggies. Um, and even just generally, it seems like they're like fruit and veggies are kind of getting a lot of pushback lately. Why do you, why do you think that is? Where do you think that's coming from? Oh man, I've known these guys for many, many years. Uh, I like both of them. Yeah, I like I, both I, of them. Yes. Yes. They're doing some good work. This is a hard one too. Uh, Cause I can see both sides. I can see, Oh man, the, the, there is something to do with anti-nutrients and there is something to do with oxalates. And so I'll do a personal story. I did spinach and kale shakes with almond milk for years, back like seven or eight years ago in the beginning of my health journey. And I thought I was feeling good. I'm like, oh, I'm so healthy, right? And I did this every day for like two years in a row. And then I developed all these skin problems. Basically, I had like gut issues and skin problems. Yep. And oh, yeah. it was just, it was a nightmare. And I'm like, my face was completely red. It was like flaky, like all these things. Cut it out and all of my problems went away. And I lost like five pounds of fat that I didn't even know I had. It was just my, I was inflamed the entire time. And I'm just like, oh my God, I feel way better. Lost fat, you know? Okay, there's something to it, right? But what I was doing was doing something very out of human nature, Right? right. This is not, I was not eating seasonally. This is nothing that anyone has ever done throughout history is putting a bunch of kale and spinach and all milk in a blender every single day. So that's so, okay. So I see the one side of like, yes, plants have anti-nutrients and they can be a problem. But I also see the other side of say Lane Norton. It's like plants are perfectly great. All these studies show, you know, the epidemiology shows people eat more mm -hmm. plants do better fruits and vegetables. Great. And so I see that side. I'm like, absolutely. If you're eating these in normal amounts and they're part of your diet, absolutely. And that also I, I do, I think there's a, a different way to look at, at fruits and vegetables. To me, it's, I don't think that they're magical or required. I think that they are kind of a proxy for eating whole foods. So I think it, all this epidemiology that shows that people who eat plants more fruits and vegetables are healthier. It's like, yes, it's pushing off processed foods off your plate. Mm -hmm. And you're doing all these other healthy, there's, we know about the healthy user bias. These people are doing all these other healthy behaviors, drinking less, smoking less, exercising more. So there's a lot going on. To me, they're, they're, they're almost just a proxy for someone who eats whole foods and that they're fine. And also I think there's another benefit to them is that it, 
it's on this nutrient to energy spectrum. It's it's well, humans eat three to four pounds of food per day. This is there's another study that this this is what happens, right? This is what we do to fill ourselves up. And if you having more fruits and vegetables in your diet is a way to get full, basically. So you need protein and nutrients for long-term satiety, but for short-term satiation, it's good to have fruits and vegetables, right? Because then it fills up your stomach, but they aren't very energy dense. So it's like, I have sauerkraut, pickles, stuff like that with my meals. It's great. So people, uh, I work with some carnivore people, they're, they, they're like, I can eat forever. Like I'll eat like five steaks. And, you know, I'm like, and I get it because they're just, their stomach doesn't even get full and they, they just keep eating. So I'm like, well, what if we add some sauerkraut and pickles or, you know, something like this? These are like, they fill up your stomach with water and fiber. Not that like fiber is magical, right? I mean, some fiber, you know, you could get some. Pre- yeah, fi- fiber is not so great for me personally, but exactly. yeah, for some people it is. Exactly. Yeah. So there's a lot of, there's a whole story with fiber. So I, I'm not one of these people, like I agree with Paul and Sean Baker. It's like, you don't need fiber. Yes. You, humans do not need fiber, but the, I think the benefit of, of eating whole foods and eating fiber is just merely that it's filling up your stomach mm-hmm. for less calories, right? You're not like a potato chip is the worst thing to do because it has like, it, it's a very dense source of calories and doesn't fill you up. So it's like the opposite would be sauerkraut. It's like 10 calories for like a huge scoop of sauerkraut. Mm -hmm. Brian, you are way too reasonable, man. Like, how are you going to go viral on TikTok if you don't hop into a dogma? (laughs) Oh, I know. I know. That's my problem. Um, (laughs) So uh, one one other thing on um, saturated fat, and then I want to hear a lot about food lies, because that's that's how I personally found you originally. And then Dr. K kind of brought you back into my brain. Um, But carbs are... They, they've kind of taken the brunt of the hit as far as like insulin resistance goes. More recently, it seems like some stuff is starting to come out about saturated fat being linked to insulin resistance. What can you say about that? Well, the carbs or the saturated fat or, or both? Um, I, I guess both. Yeah. Well, okay. More so, so the saturated fat. Well, yeah. Well, I guess I'll do a little carbs. For carb, to me, yeah, I was in the anti carb thing for the first couple of years, right? Because it worked for me. And I think mm-hmm. it is a great way to actually increase the nutrient to energy ratio of your diet, right? If you're, if you're cutting out a whole bunch of carbs, that's uh, most of the carbs are bad anyway, right? It's just refined grains, sugars, stuff like that. So you're getting rid of those. It's good. You're eating a lot less refined foods, less, less processed foods and less energy. It's so therefore you're eating more nutrients, you know, if you cut something out. Uh, so yeah, but then now I, I think it's great for people if they can go on their journey and then add carbs back in, they aren't poison. You know, that's not that it's not like these carbs are just going to kill you. This is this is what some people think. So uh, I don't think they cause diabetes, right? I get it that high blood sugar is a is a part of diabetes, but it's like what got you there? And uh, yeah, I, I I just do not think that saturated fat has has anything to do with diabetes. It's just the same thing. It's just we didn't have diabetes when we're eating. We've always eaten saturated fat. Like this is like to me, diabetes. It's it's a energy toxicity. It's like you you gave your system too much energy, right? Namely, empty calories. To me, right. it's, whether fat or carbs, too much energy. This is what diabetes is now. So your body doesn't know what to do with it. So your fat cells get overstuffed. They get inflamed. Then you start storing fat in and around your organs, visceral fat, right? This is the the process of getting diabetes. That doesn't have anything to do with saturated fat. To me, it has to do with eating too much energy. And this is the stuff that me and Lane kind of come, like I, I'm like kind of the bridge between there's this whole ancestral world and then there's like this like science-based, evidence-based medicine world of Lane. And I, I'm like trying to bridge that gap and be like, let's let's all work together on this, guys. And and part of the, the theory of how diabetes starts is is something that Lane can agree with and the evidence people can agree with. It's just that you're eating too much energy. And why are you doing that? Mm-hmm. And it, it could be from the seed oils or not. I mean, it could be from saturated fat. That's another thing. Lane doesn't believe in the demonization of seed oil specifically. And maybe it is just because they're in everything and it's too much energy. And it really is just the excess of empty calories. Seed oils are the ultimate empty calorie. At least butter, you get some fat-soluble vitamins and nutrients, yeah, stuff like yeah. that. But yeah, I mean, I don't want people to eat endless 
butter either. Right. So, but I, I don't think <laughs> that's one of the wildest things is people just eating like bricks of, of, of butter. And I'm just like, I'm like, look, like, I feel like you've overcorrected at this point, you know, like you're like you went, you went from no fat is, is uh, good for you to literally eating globs of fat. Like it's, it's wild how people overcorrect. <laughs> it is. They're like thinking they're like healthy. They're like on Instagram, like, oh yeah, oh, I covered my whole steak in butter. I'm like, yeah. okay, butter isn't bad, but you, that doesn't mean yeah. Endless. Excess so, is never good. This is the thing that we can agree on with these people. Yeah. So it's, it's the excess, but it's, it's, you always have to say why the excess, why do people eat too many calories? No one wants to eat too many calories, but people do. Right. So it's like, you can't just blame it on too much. Right. So then you, that's why you have to go to the second layer. That's why I get into the nutrient to energy ratio and the stuff I mentioned with Robin Heimer and Simpson and the protein leverage hypothesis, because that actually gets more to explain why did someone eat too much energy? No one ate too many nutrients. No one's, fat or diabetic because they ate too too much protein or nutrients. It's exactly. because you ate too many refined fats or carbs. And it's basically if you, you, you ate too many empty calories because you're, the food you chose did not have enough protein and nutrients in it to keep you full. Right. Yeah, Is that absolutely. Yeah. It, no, it, it 100% makes sense to me. Cause yeah, it's, you know, it's like you said, you, you, you will pretty much never see somebody who's eating a high protein, high nutrient diet that's going to end up becoming insulin resistant. It just, it just doesn't happen that way. Yeah. This is not um, really possible. Yeah. Yeah. So you're all, all these different hats that you're wearing and, you know, I, I covered it in the intro, but you're also a filmmaker and you've been working on, you alluded to it a couple of times already, but you've been working on this six part documentary called food lies. Um, what, what prompted this for you and, and what can you tell us about it? Wow. Yeah. Well, about 10 years ago, I lost both my parents. And so that woke me up. So I'm 30. I'm dad bod. You know, I'm following the food pyramid. I have all these problems, joint pain, acid reflux, allergies, you know, excess body fat, this whole thing. And then I actually credit Mark Sisson. I, re I read the book Primal Blueprint. That's why. I mean, that got me on this ancestral journey. Like you said, it just made sense. You're like, okay, this makes sense. And uh, so I read that, lost, yeah, whatever, 25 pounds of body fat. My friends did the same. It, it was just incredible. And so I just, six years ago, I saw one of, what the health, right? one more of these vegan films. And I just had <laughs> enough. I just had enough. And I grew yeah. up doing film stuff. And, you know, I was always interested in that in high school and, and all that. But then I went off to engineering school and left it and then I came back around. I'm like, I'm just going to make a documentary. So yeah, six years, uh, just quit my job, did, th did this. And we actually just finished episode one. We've been showing it around. Actually, Lane, yeah, he, he was one of the first people to watch it. He had yeah, great feedback. I'm so excited for this, dude. Sorry, continue. Uh, oh, yeah. So yeah, it it's kind of explaining this entire thing that we've been trying to talk about is what do humans eat, right? It's, it's an endless question that no one has the answer to right and it's almost like opposite where people it's confusing because seemingly opposite diets work and there's vegans versus carnivores there's all this so it's the ultimate way to describe to the every man and the every woman how to do this what do you eat explain food and it's going to take six episodes and we have to start with evolution and just you know where did we come from and we'll we'll end with regenerative agriculture and how to do this properly. And uh, yeah, it's going to be huge. Yeah, I really, really cannot wait for this. Like it's like, like I said, that was kind of the first little intro to you was hearing that kind of get tossed around a few different podcasts. And then, you know, Dr. Kate kind of bringing you back in. But um, in in one of the, uh, I, I think it might have actually been an interview with Lane, um, which like I said, like one of my favorite uh probably probably my favorite episode mm. of your podcast that you've ever done are are the ones that you've done with Lane. I just I I love hearing you guys talk because where you guys disagree is is so interesting and it's it's such like a so many people are like trying to figure out that middle ground between you guys but mm -hmm. uh you mentioned how you've had to go through a couple different rewrites actually putting food lies together because you wanted it to be as accurate as possible. You wanted to essentially make it debunk proof. Um, what are some of the things that as you started doing it, as you started researching it, you're like, oh, this is not what I thought. Like, we've got to, we've got to make a change. Like, we've got to rewrite some of this. What were some of those things that came up? Well, it's mainly just the low carb paradigm. 
And like I said, I admitted that I, I, it worked for me in the beginning and I thought that was the way. And there's a lot of people, and I know Lane Norton hates these guys like Gary Tobbs and these people that went yeah. all in on this hypothesis that it's a, it's a CIM, the carbohydrate insulin model, right? Yeah. And that means that like, if you eat carbs, your insulin goes up and you can't, and it blocks fat burning and you get fat, you know, something like that. And they kind of disproved that with some of these studies and Peter T was involved and they had this thing called NUSI and they did these tests and it, it kind of turned out that it, it was about the same, like low carb, low fat, like it didn't matter, which is still kind of what I believe. In. So basically, yep. uh, it's, it's just getting, there's this whole way of thinking about the world where you think that the carbs are the problem and we had to completely come out of that and then realize that it's excess energy, it's empty energy is the problem. And this is pretty much what Lane believes and pretty most people can kind of agree on. So, so we had to just be like, to be undebunkable, we have to just use this paradigm. And then, like you said, it's not as sexy, right? It's not like you, Saladino's yelling at everyone about going to Whole Foods and or whatever he does. <laughs> Don't eat this fucking broccoli. Yeah, it's like, okay, that gets, he's got a lot of followers, right? Way more yeah. than me. I say broccoli is bullshit, bullshit. or kale yeah, is bullshit. bullshit to draw attention to the fact that many vegetables do contain substances that can be harmful for some people. But uh, yeah, so this concept, it's not super sexy, but it's like empty energy, right? It's just like what empty calories. My grandma would say that back in the day. Don't eat the empty calories. My mom would say, don't eat. And I'm like, holy smokes. That's, that's it. That's like actually the answer to everything. It's like, and it's carbs or fat. You can't. And what is society? It's mostly empty calories. Most foods. What is, you could ask a hundred, you could ask a thousand people on the street. What are their favorite foods? Their most favorite indulgent foods. Every single one of them is going to be mostly empty calories. There's going to be low protein, low nutrient, high fat or carb or both. Yeah. So there's yeah, a, yeah, sorry, go ahead. embrace that paradigm. No, I just remember the question. So, to, <laughs> so uh, basically we had to just change the film and to, to get away from the whole low carb thing and just switch to, Hey, animal foods are good. Processed foods are bad. Empty energy is, is the problem. Why did no one wants to eat too much, but they do anyway, there's a satiety factor in there and that has to do with nutrient to energy ratio. And yeah, basically the whole paradigm had to switch to like that. Yeah, it's it, it really is such a bummer that um, it's kind of like the information is almost as good as it is like sexy and provocative. But as soon as you just go like base level, like, hey, people are overeating calories, people are under eating nutrients. It's like, you know, it doesn't really uh, like yeah. go. It, it, it's like, OK, well, yeah, but I want something impressive. I want something crazy. Like I want something that's going to make everyone go, whoa. So, yeah, just like sometimes the the truth doesn't really resonate for people if it's not viral in some kind of way and it, it 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 really to i guess just be kind of blind like it sucks dude it's really really unfortunate oh, that's how we are but well we're um, making it cool yeah yeah like good through, yeah, yeah boom yeah. there there we go that's all we need yeah <laughs> uh, a lot of a lot of these food guidelines um you know that because you're you how, how old did you say you are 40 40 okay so i'm i'm 31 a lot of these food guidelines out there came from and i mean i didn't learn this until i was probably like early twenties or something like that, they're made by marketers and food manufacturers and basically the people who are, who are creating the like boxed crap that, you know, the, the like average American is, is eating and they end up being the ones who are making these dietary guidelines. Right. Uh, what, what are some of the things that you've seen as far as that goes? Mm, well, that's episode three. Yeah. That's, that's like a whole story in itself. It's, this is what happened in the, I think it started in the fifties and, and, and maybe we didn't know back then, right? Maybe we were just clueless about what caused heart disease. I think, I always think I'm a little conspiratorial <laughs> where I'm like, <laughs> all right, I think big money always pushes things. And I, and I have this conspiracy theory that they actually knew what they were doing in blaming saturated fat, right? If you blame red meat and animal fat for the problems, then you, what's the solution? Well, seed oils and process and foods are fine it's like if all calories are the same they're kind of just like well all calories are the same and saturated fat's bad so what does that give you the food industry that has been insane since then billions right? and billions of dollars Billion. and then I, I learned more about how that all works by starting my company knows the tale like 
So I told you, I'm into the regenerative ag thing, right? So started this thing, we do the best meat, makes no money. It's a nightmare. Like you're trying, you know, these people, these ranchers, you, you got to pay them well. It's all these things that go into it. And then I realized, oh, this is why the world is the way it is. You can sell a box of cereal where the box probably costs more than the cereal. Yep. And, right? So you have the like three cents of cereal, you have a box that's four cents and you sell it for five ninety nine, dollars whatever it is in the grocery wow. store, right? Yeah. Think of that times billions, billions of boxes of cereal across the US. And then what do you do with all that money? You pay for lobbying, pay for marketing, right? But what is every single thing, commercial on TV, process food, process food, process food, on magazine, everything. And then you pay for studies. So, and then you're like, oh, Barilla yes. Pasta studies. Oh my oh, gosh. Barilla Pasta funded this. Oh, pasta is good for the heart, blah, blah, blah. Right? This is how, this is how, same thing with the pharmaceuticals. Who's funding all this stuff? So the world is just set up against us, right? Well, there's a, like, there's, there's, there's so much to be said about like the way that I guess propaganda around, you know, food propaganda actually is. Um, like there, you, you've you've already mentioned one. I can't remember which one, but then you know there's game changers, and uh, more recently, um, you are what you eat. Uh, you know these vegan documentaries, which I, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily call them a documentary. Um, like not to be that guy for for anybody who's listening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's like how how does the how would you say the average person can figure out when something is propaganda versus when something is real information? Because it's you know they're they're coming up against essentially the entire like food uh industry oh it's almost impossible yeah it, well you have to completely come out of of society and that's what i'm doing here in austin where it's like we're almost creating a movement here we're trying to create a movement of people that that reject all this stuff and it's like once you kind of understand how it works then you have to reevaluate everything that you see and almost every message out there in the mainstream is kind of in direct opposition to individual health. That's kind of what I found. And it's almost like a law of nature. If you just think of like big governments or big, you think back to the pyramids and pharaohs. It's like, how do we control the masses, right? This is just, it's like, what's good to control the masses? Almost from a fundamental law of nature is bad for the individual, mm -hmm. right? So then that's, I just kind of look at society differently that way. It's like, okay, well, everything, if they're just doing these sweeping health generalizations in the past four years, Right, that that it's not really for the individual health. It's supposed to be for the group health or for to make things easier. So you kind of have to just think about it that way, where it's like, okay, I need to reevaluate what is good for me and what and does this make sense ancestrally? I'm not saying that an ancestral view is always right, but like if someone's telling me that that this pasta is good for me, then you'd be okay. Just you got to check it, like with human history. It's like well, why would a processed food that was just invented in the last few hundred years, or if you, you could say, okay, well, processing grains for 10,000 years, that's still a fraction of human history. Why yeah. would that be better than, for me than, whole, than something we've always eaten? Well, and those processed grains that we've been having for thousands of years too, weren't filled with glyphosate and were grown in much better quality and all, all these other, you know, mm -hmm. and, 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 where it's mm -hmm. like, it's not the same as the kind of grains that, that people are getting nowadays. Um, you've, I, I love that you said, you know, I'm kind of a conspiracy theorist on this because I kind of am too. Uh, but the thing is like, it's, it's only conspiracy as far as it is not true. Right. So mm -hmm. the holistic health, the natural health, ancestral health, all the, all these different kinds of groups, they get the conspiracy theory, like label thrown at them all the time where like where do you think that well actually that's probably a conspiracy theory and it's in itself is where do you think that came from why do you think the people who are eating whole foods are getting called conspiracy theorists yeah well i i like to look back in history and actually uh, the term quack was propaganda it actually was coined yep. by i think the rockefeller group i don't like to blame just like oh it's the rockefellers or like it's you the know, money the, it's the it's a this it's a that I, but sometimes yeah, yeah, it or is. people blame like big families it's like oh it's all bill gates or it's all like the bilderberger group or something yeah. but it, i mean the the rockefeller group i i did you know read and watch some things about that where they specifically w wanted to use their model of healthcare. they found out they could make pharmaceuticals and procedures 
and they wanted to smear the holistic medicine. And so they coined the word. It was like from a think tank. They're like, okay, how do we do this? We invented the word quack. And anyone who didn't, who used natural food, diet, lifestyle, herbs, whatever, were quacks. And it was an actual PR campaign. And what PR is, is propaganda, actually. There's a whole story there about how that's actually what it is. It's propaganda. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so that's that's basically what's, what's still happening is that, yeah, all our people I, who, who want the whole foods are being purposely smeared. Yeah. Well, and I, I think, um, and nobody quote me on this, but I think the word conspiracy theorist was actually coined by the CIA too. So to, to kind of echo the, you know, quack, um, word creation. I, I think that also might be the case for a conspiracy theorist. Um, I, I know we said, uh, an hour and we're, we're coming up on that. I don't suppose you got like five, 10 minutes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Cool. Um, one, do you by chance have an update on a release date for food lies? No, well, we've been showing it around. So we only have one of six episodes done, but we're pitching it to studios. Yeah. We're getting a lot of good feedback and we just need someone to help us finish it quickly and, uh, get it up on a big platform like Netflix. Are you guys still accepting funding for it? Yeah, it's foodlies.org and it links to the Indiegogo. And you can you can get it first. You you can get the the pre-order copy like sent to you. There we go, guys. Get get to it. Foodlies.org, you said? Yep. Perfect, perfect. Um uh so you you you've talked a little bit about regenerative rege, ugh, cannot do words, regenerative agriculture. Um and nose to tail dieting. You have your company, you've made content on this. Uh for someone who has no idea what regenerative agriculture is. What can you tell us about it? Yeah, well, it's just the best way to raise animals and it can actually help the land. And this is just how the world has always worked. And we just need to go back to it, really. And, and people would probably know about CAFOs, you know, these confined feeding operations. And that's a really efficient way to, to raise animals, but it's just not good. It's kind of just separating from nature. Anything where you decouple from nature it it turns bad, right? So that's how I think of food. It's like we just decoupled food from its whole source, right? That's what what is processed foods? You you are extracting things and recombining them. Like you just need food in its whole form. Once you decouple it from its whole form, you're screwed, right? And so it's the same thing with anything, like anything with natural health. If you want to know the answer to anything, it's like go back to nature, go back to the whole source. And realize that most things in modern society have been decoupled from nature. And that's exactly what happened with the food system or the ran ranching or raising animals, right. right? Instead of having a pig or a chicken running around on the ground, you know, eating scraps, eating it's kept uh, bugs, in a tiny little freaking bin. They're, yeah, they're in a warehouse now, right? And it's, yep. so it's like, it's more efficient. And then everything is like, okay, let's grow a bunch of grains and then we'll feed it to them. And then they're going to be in a warehouse. And then, yeah, it's decoupled from how it's supposed to be, and it's always worse. It's worse for yeah. the environment. It's worse for the animal. It's worse for the fat ratios. Of, of It's worse for the meat that you eat and the fat that you eat from them. So yeah. yeah, regenerative is just going back to the real way to do it, and it's just the best. Yeah, there's a there's a book called um, Alter Genes Twisted Truth, I believe, where it's uh, it talks a lot about that, where it's like, you know, you uh, – take this low quality feed and then you feed it to an animal and then you can find it in this space. And then, you know, those genes propagate and create lower quality health animals. And then we're consuming that. And, you know, you, you are what you eat is a relatively true thing out there. Um, one of the, so the other thing about regenerative agriculture, it, it kind of is this cyclical thing too, right? Where it's like, you're feeding the animals with stuff that you grow usually from their manure and this and that. And yeah, so it all kind of like feeds into each other where it becomes a system that kind of self self propagates itself. Correct. Well, yeah, nature is cyclical. Nature is harmonious. It's harmonious cycles. That's the whole thing, right? That's how we got here. This whole planet is a one big harmonious cycle. And yes, exactly. One of the, one of the complaints that I've seen about regenerative agriculture is, well, Oh, this is nice. And, uh, it makes sense, but it doesn't really work to scale. It won't work for like the the entire globe. What would your response be to that? Has anyone flown over the United States and looked down? <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever looked down? Oh my a, god! 
trans con oh my god it's, it's amazing you be, yeah for hours and hours you can just look down at land and land and land and yeah i mean it's not gonna work it's not gonna be easy at all I, I don't even think it's possible with our current system right our current system is set up for big business and corporations and all that and they're not gonna want this but it is theoretically possible i would say and what would it would be a long slow process but we would change all of these millions of acres of corn wheat and soy and we would have animals grazing and mixed farms and you know no-till crops and yes you you could absolutely do it and some professor did some math on it once and i i wish i had that link or name offhand but we have millions and millions of acres to work with it just would be very hard to change the system yeah it's kind of the kind of the system in the way of creating a better system more or less uh, I don't suppose you've seen those those memes out there where it's like um, reject modernity, go back to nature. Uh, it sounds like something I would make, but no, I don't know if I've yeah. seen this. Uh... It's 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 basically just like I'll I'll have to send you one after this, but yeah, it's it's basically just a, a joke where it's like all of our problems are because of modernity, and you know mm -hmm. that's probably a bit blown out of proportion, but it is a thing that is true to it to a degree. Um, Anyway, I, dude, thank you so much for your time. Like, this has been an awesome conversation. Is there is there anything I didn't ask you so far that you really want to make sure you talk about? No, no, we covered a lot of it. Yeah, I'm I'm hoping people stuck around to the end here because this stuff it's it's not sexy, but like if you kind of grasp what we were saying, I think it'll make your comprehension of all this so much better, and then you won't get stuck in a dietary camp, and you'll just realize that. Yeah, kind of the modernity thing is true. It's just like you don't, but also we don't have to go back and live in a cave either. Yeah. It's like, how do, how do you, you can have both? It's like we can reject the modern norms and still live in normal society and be normal. And it's just like, okay, well, I just go to the farmer's market for my eggs, right? Yeah. It's like the simplest thing. I mean, it costs more, but I, I'm happy to pay because I don't have to go to the grocery store and get the terrible eggs. It's yeah. like, simple. And I the 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 like cost of it as far as like what you gain for longevity too of having good quality food i mean god this is like a whole different rabbit hole that we're gonna end up going down <laughs> yeah. um if if people want to find you um you know your podcast your website all these different things i'll, I'll drop them in the um mm -hmm. you know in the description but just if people want to find you if people want to hear more about you where would you want them to go just search food lies wherever you're at if you're at instagram food lies i'm there at youtube food lies just anywhere to search food lies that's just the best place to start Perfect. And then um, in your personal Instagram? Food, food dot lies. Food dot lies. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Uh, and then you have a meat company as well. What, what one's, what's that called? Nose to tail. Yeah. Nose, Nose to, to tail. Tail. org. All right. All right. Lovely. Well, guys, um, this is Brian Sanders with Sapien, Peak Human, Food Lies, and probably a couple other things. Nose to tail. Uh, and Nose to tail. And Sapien. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Andrew Briggs with Holistic Motion. Um, so until next time, guys, see y'all later. What a guest, huh, guys? Please go comment on their Instagram and let them know that you saw them here. And while you're just doing things that I ask you to, make sure to click this top video that I have linked. That is the last episode of the podcast, which I guarantee will add 10 pounds of muscle to your body. I'll see you there. Later. Later.